Hi there, and welcome to the latest OAG podcast. I caught up with Mark Dunnerke from ATR last week to discuss how the aircraft manufacturing industry has been impacted by COVID-19. And while we have all heard and may even have been impacted by the grounding of aircraft such as the A380 and the early retirement of the wide-bodied Boeing 747 fleets of some airlines, in the regional market, it seems that there is much more optimism and opportunity emerging as we recover from COVID-19. Have a listen, I hope you enjoy it, and please let us have any feedback. Thank you. Mark, delighted that you're joining us. You're head of Europe, Middle East and Africa for ATR. I'm intrigued. How did an Irishman end up in Toulouse? It's, it sounds a strange journey. Um, so, John, uh, firstly, uh, great to, to catch up. I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to chat. Um, I need to correct, although we're cousins, uh, I'm actually Scottish. Um, and since last week, I'm also French. <laughs> Congratulations. So I got my French nationality, which was uh, highly important, uh, given the rest of the family are all French. Um, so look, uh, the story is quite, uh, quite a simple one, uh, always been in, in aviation. Uh, of course, largely in the, the regional space. Uh, started my career in the Netherlands with a, a small regional uh, Dutch airline. Uh, from there, spent 10 years with BAE. Uh, largely across, uh, you know, marketing, business development, sales. Uh, then uh, moved to Toulouse as part of a JV uh, and actually spent some time at ATR, uh, therefore, over 20 years ago during the then JV between uh, British Aerospace and, and uh, Aerospatiale. Um, and then from there joined uh, Embraer, where I spent 17 years across uh, multiple different uh, roles that took me through Paris, uh, Dublin, Singapore, uh, and then eventually uh, came back uh, full circle to, to France uh, and delighted to have uh, joined uh, ATR uh, just over a year and a half ago. Um, so that's my, my story and my, my background is actually studying wise was maritime commerce, believe it or not. Right. We've always said if it's a plane, train, a bus, carts, it's all the same principle. Yeah, it's, it certainly is. Um, and my, there are some amazing similarities between all of those industries. But um, sure. it, I'm intrigued because when I, when I think of ATR, um, I have a very historic, almost um, dinosaur probably impression of um, aircraft that always seem to have some sort of emission on the, on the, cowlings at the back of the turbo props and noisy um but i suspect that's not the case anymore is it oh no, nothing could be further from the truth uh, john i mean in, if you look at the uh, the current offering the the 600 series i mean this is a you know a, it's impressively modern aircraft uh, i've always said and, and i've you know said at many conferences in the past uh, the issue with the ATR is perhaps physically on the outside, it doesn't appear to, to change, you know, apart from the extra props. But under the skin, this is a, a hugely modern aircraft, you know, whether it's from the, uh, the cockpit layout through uh, the systems we have on board. And we've always approached it from the point of view that any investment has to make sense for the, the customer. So, you know, the space we occupy is, uh, we are the most economical solution in, in regional aviation. Uh, and I think when you, you see some of the things that are coming out of the COVID situation, it kind of reaffirms that, that view. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 I mean, one of the real positives of, of the ATR, of course, is for me, you know, the opportunity to turn left when you board an aircraft is a unique experience. But for you, it's, it's what everyone has to do, isn't it? Um, say again in, in terms of what uh, in what terms you... of when you normally when you normally turn left you know you're heading to first or business class uh, oh, and right send you down into uh, economy but um, to have that opportunity to turn left is um, is really refreshing for someone like me Look, the, the the number of people that i talk to uh, in the industry who who have that perception 
in general of turboprops and then when they fly on the aircraft they go out of their their way to to complement the product uh and that's the issue making people understand that this is a very quiet aircraft um it doesn't have uh, you know the the noise issues on board the vibration that people seem to associate with it um yeah. but just to, to share with you um you know in the context of the world we we live in today uh just a small stat and i know you love statistics um you know at the peak of the COVID, we had 40 percent of the, the global um, uh, atr fleet flying um you start to benchmark that against other product types and, and you see why we're so bullish on, on the role it plays in, in certainly in regional connectivity and aviation in general. And that that's an interesting point, isn't it? The fact that, you know, pre pre this horrible COVID event, um, I would imagine business was looking quite good for you uh, in terms of the order book, um, you know, your size and scale of aircraft relative to emergent markets, et cetera. Um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we had a, a strong 219. We were set for, you know, a, a similar pattern across this year. Uh, we've delivered, as you know, close to, to 1,600 airplanes, and we have, you know, 200 operators in over 100 countries. So we really have a, a very strong uh, global footprint. Um, I think the issue we faced, of course, like every company, when, when COVID uh, hit the, the shores, uh, you had to bunker down and try and assess the impact uh, across multiple factors. Uh, for us, it was largely, of course, in the first instance, uh, in being there for our customers, um, listening to them, talking to them, making sure we, we helped in whatever way we could. And then, of course, about our own people, uh, making sure that uh, they were physically safe. So we went into the, the, the uh, working from home mode. Uh, we're all back at the, uh, the cold face now. Um, Pleased to, to share with you, you know, we've got to get that positive news out there. But 69% uh, of the, uh, the pre COVID ATR network has already been restored. Wow. Uh, and that's something that uh, we're, we're hugely proud of. Uh, I can't resist having a little bit of a dig at the regional jet just to point out to you that they're about 15% behind on that same curve. Um, so we do feel that we're, we're in the right place and, and business will come back and, and is that do you think that is about you know um the efficiency of the aircraft the cost of operation um and the fact that it you know it is actually the right probably the right size fit for what many markets and where the world is today oh no it's it's spot on i mean we're, we're in the sweet spot in that sense we we don't pretend to be something we're not but when it comes to regional connectivity and, and you know, the, the essential links, the lifelines, um, you know, there's multiple opportunities. We can maybe chat a little bit later on some hard examples, but uh, where we've, we've been the, uh, the people moving the medical equipment or the adaptability and resilience of the product and, and flexibility we can offer in converting to cargo, uh, putting seat bags on. We did a whole bunch of repatriation flights um, one of them for, for your, your record was uh, a return Dar es Salaam to, to Joburg, repatriating in, in both sense, um, Tanzanians and South Africans. So, uh, you know, really proud of, of the role that ATR has played in, in the peak of the, the crisis. Uh, and that's making some people uh, take another look because when you've got a, a product that you know can ride out <laughs> arguably, and I, I think there's no doubt about this, the worst crisis any of us could even have, have imagined in our lifetime. Uh, that's a real uh, testament to the, the Yeah, I mean, you know, in many markets, we went down to less than 10% of capacity. And, and if you were still flying, you know, large elements or your customers were flying large elements of your fleets, then you were making a very significant proportion of all of the, the commercial operations that were taking place. Um, but how, where has the growth been in recent years? Because um, I read some of your forecasting analysis, which is really very interesting and very helpful. And it, it says that it's not just the emergent markets where you see the growth, is it? It's, it's also those more mature markets where there's a combination of fleet replacement and new opportunities. No, it's, it's uh, multiple, Sean. But, um... 
you know, just to give you one example, 41% uh, of ATR's network didn't exist 10 years ago. So it's a very, as I said, resilient uh, product. Um, you know, we are the best solution to provide that, that regional connectivity and those vital links. Uh, it's not just about, you know, hopping from island to island, it's uh, it across the board. We've equally mm -hmm. got the, you know, when you look at the, the business models we operate in, you've got some some giants in the industry as well. You've got people like Indigo and, and Wings and Lion Air, uh, the low cost model and the suitability of the platform in there. Um, so it really, it touches so many bases uh, within that market segment that we would say is is ours uh, and we're the leader in. And that that's, that's quite interesting in itself because, you know, we, I, I guess we all have a perception that you can't use um, a turboprop such as an ATR piece of equipment for low cost type operators. Um, but that actually isn't the case, is it? I mean, you can, you can be as competitive on your seat cost as many other aircraft types. Uh, absolutely, John. I mean, we've, we've already got that in, in the base formula, but when you start to add on as well, environmental credentials um, and, and you've, you've followed those closely in terms of, of what we put out uh, as, as the reasoning behind uh, the ATR, the fact that we burn substantially less fuel than a jet. Take Europe as the example, uh, we see a pattern emerging whereby, you know, states are, are stepping in to, to help their, their flag carriers and national carriers, the industries, but at the same time, they're making it very clear they want uh, a good return on the sustainability uh, angle. Um, you know, the conditionality of that and saying you've got to fly greener. Keep in mind, uh, just towards the end of last year, we, we were the first commercial aircraft to be financed through green financing. Uh, and that was uh, yet again an endorsement that we, we link. And do you think airlines still see that as a something that they um, have to be conscious of moving forward. I mean, in the last four or five months, it's, it, most airlines have just thought about survival. Um, but do you see that whole environmental sustainability, um, marketing message and, you know, desire to change uh, coming back? Um, yes, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's 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 there. You, you saw before, you know, COVID, we had the uh, movement and, uh, you know, the flying shame in, in Scandinavia. Um, I, I'd say that uh, in general, if, if we look at COVID and, and how the industry is emerging, um, you know, I've said to a few people, it's, to me, it's a bit like a, a forest fire. And if you've seen a forest fire, you know, you know it's devastating. <laughs> Everything's gone. Yeah. Uh, literally within days uh, and then weeks, you've got things popping up and growing again. And within two years, you probably wouldn't even know there'd been a forest fire there. So I, I think we're facing a, a formidable opportunity as, as an industry. Um, you know, we will be uh, a key player in this in terms of moving forward uh, to, to reassess uh, the whole uh, model of, of flying. Will we see more point to point? Will people want to avoid the, the big airports? Uh, will we see more uh, local uh, tourism? Will people want to, to just stay within the, their country or the neighboring country? Um, so we, we see a real interesting pattern developing. And, and the other point I'd share with you, John, is pre-COVID, you would have seen a, a ladder of, you know, uh, hierarchy in terms of the, the airlines and, and up at the top were the, um, you know, the big national flag carriers. Yeah. Uh, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. And uh, to have a whole bunch of wide bodies and narrow bodies parked is an enormous cash drain, as you well know. Mm -hmm. We've seen with a, a lot of our operators who were some of them smaller uh, operators with, with reduced, you know, small fleets, uh, easier to shutter the shop. And then the next morning, you, you know, when the crisis is over, you pull the shutter up and, and you're off and, and doing business again. Yeah. And so the it, uh, is It's fascinating. Uh, you're right, Mark. I think big is beautiful. Um, certainly isn't the case at this moment in time, is it? it you lose that ability to be fleet of foot, um, you know, and in the last four or five months, if, if it's told us anything from an aviation perspective, you know, some of the, some of the aircraft types and some of the operations were, were becoming folly, almost like a, a South Sea bubble that had to burst. 
Well, John, if, if, you know, if I think back to January, which seems now like a, a decade ago, it's unbelievable when we think of where we are today. You know, we had the uh, finance and, and leasing community gathering in Dublin for the annual get together. You know, you had thousands of people congregating around the, the central there in, in Shelburne. Um, you know, a lot of our, our experts in the field have talked about, you know, the black swan event because we'd had 10 years of pretty good times. Yeah, a bit of a turn down coming in, in certain quarters, but the message was clear. You know, there is a black swan event could come. Mm -hmm. what, what they didn't tell us was the black swan would have its wings clipped and would have a bag over its head. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the it's it's challenging to see how we we steer our way through this. But at least from the, the ATR perspective, uh, we're we're realistic. Uh, but um, personally, I'm, I'm by nature a more optimistic individual, a realist. Mm -hmm. Optimistic. And I think um, we will see uh, opportunities opportunities coming along. You know, some people are recognizing, arguably, this could be one of the best times to, to renew fleet and buy new aircraft. Um, or indeed, start a new airline if you're extremely brave and a billionaire who wants to be a millionaire. You, you've, you've, you've hit the one of the key points. Um, we're certainly seeing an increase in interest in startup. Because as much as someone vacates a space, um, others will look at it as, as an opportunity. And that's always been the essence of, of our industry, particularly at the regional end. Mm -hmm. Talk, Mark, talking of opportunities, there has been discussion, I know, for some time about um, why Europe and European airlines haven't adopted the ACMI model um, that we see prevalent in the United States amongst regional carriers. Um, is this, is what we've been through perhaps going to accelerate that opportunity? Do you think some of the legacy carriers will now become more interested in that type of structure or, or will they want to have their own fleet, regional fleets and networks? Uh, excellent question, uh, John, and, and we're studying that uh, all the time, but certainly at the moment as well. I think it's probably too soon to, to read a conclusion yet. Uh, it's probably going to be mixtures of both. Um, you know, looking at the, the broader market, um, you know, we covered, personally, I cover a jurisdiction of different markets, you know, with, with Africa and, and Europe and the Middle East, et cetera. But if you look at how they're all going to react differently, I think how fast people come out of confinement. Um, we see isolated cases where countries shut down again as, as almost as soon as they open. That's mm -hmm. going to have to be factored in. Um, I would say the capacity provider model, certainly in the European context, has, has come into its own now. Uh, I would have agreed with you, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it, it, it just wasn't opportune. The market wasn't there. So it was already there before COVID. It was a bit of a, a tendency to consolidate amongst players. Um, I think the, the other factor to look at is, is some of the majors uh, walking away from the smaller space. And uh, that, I think, is, is a mistake. If, if you look at the opportunities in the market for regional connectivity, we all know the importance of connecting these communities for tourism, GDP, et cetera. So, um, you know, and some of the moves afoot to, to put uh, airline uh, flight numbers on buses and trains is not personally my, my view of the best solution. Um, so I think there needs to be a, a rebalance and maybe you're right, maybe that will push the capacity provider model to, to grow a little bit in, in certain markets. We, we wait and see. So the key, one of the key questions then becomes as we, as we go through this uh, recovery phase, will hubs benefit by the fact that airlines need to create that critical mass and therefore, you know, will feed more through or will regional direct services recover faster? Um, I've, I've got my opinion, but I'd be interested in, in what yours is around that particular um, debate at this moment. Um, you, you won't be surprised to hear uh, the latter. Um, you know, it's to me, it's the regional uh, connectivity. If, if you take the examples of just a couple of colleagues who tried to fly around Europe on, on relatively simple connections, it's 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 really challenging, really challenging. So I think anything that allows people to to fly point to point, you know, if we look at the the French market, um, 
you've got formidable, uh, excellent, you know, really uh, high standard uh, local airports. Um, the ability to connect uh, more, um, and we've we've shared with you in the past our, our routes model um, concept, which which identifies often where that potential traffic could be. Um, we're kind of uh, mixing into that, um, you know, the the COVID situation uh, mm -hmm. side factor, but the, the real market won't change. But uh, once we come out, it'll be largely the same. Because. You're, I, I mean, I remember that you're I'm just fascinated and, and staggered by not only the data points, you know, some of which were OAG, but you were you were looking at things such as the um, electricity footprint and wattage being used in particular markets to identify um, scale of economic growth in those regions over time, uh, trade and industry. It was, it, and I think surprisingly, you'd, you'd even found like hundreds of new city pairs that could be connected in Europe that today are, you know, disconnected for want of a better phrase. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you know our, our, our model better than I do, I think. <laughs> um, so absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's a case of uh, connecting the dots. Um, you know, I've used your own stats on, on Africa where the vast majority of capital cities aren't even connected. Mm. Um, so it comes back to, to what I, I said earlier that, you know, as a platform, uh, we're resilient, adaptable, and we provide those essential services. But at the same time, you know, the regional connectivity that we were pushing before COVID will be just as applicable post COVID. Um, and today, you know, uh, the way some of the airlines are flying, you, you've got examples like, you know, Finnair Nora with the ATR, um, the ATR flying on an Airbus route. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that's going to be the norm moving forward for, for a long period of time, but it shows the versatility of the product. Uh, it's out there and it's flying and it's connecting, and that's what we do best. Absolutely. So um, Africa is, you know, for all of us who've been in this industry for too many years, is an opportunity that never seems to happen. Um, you know, and there... There has been a headlong rush by many national airlines to satisfy perhaps their ego trips of um, Airbus equipment or brand new shiny um, Embraer type aircraft that probably don't have the right size and fit to the market. Is now an opportunity to actually reset? Is there? Do you sense there is a desire in Africa to to realise the opportunity, or is it still? encumbered with all of these historic um, ambitions that frequently end up as follies? Look, uh, I think you need to, to separate the two issues and, and it's, um, you know, you, you can put it in the context of Africa, you can equally put it in the context of, you know, open skies at ASEAN and in, uh, in Asia. So sometimes, you know, it's important to, to walk before you run. Um, what we would say in the context of Africa is we don't see any in the context of Africa, we don't see any fundamental change in the importance of that regional connectivity. Um, I think it's trying to get the message through, you know, keep reinforcing what we can bring to the, the party. Um, we're already strong as a, as a footprint in Africa, but we certainly see it as a, as a key market moving forward. Um, keep in mind, we often have the ability to, to place uh, pre-owned aircraft as well to see the customer. Uh, and that's a key factor to our advantage. Um, and some of the operators, I think, are really seeing the, the value. Uh, those that at least had ATRs during uh, the COVID crisis are seeing the value of the platform. Um, you know, we had our, our friends in Precision Air, for example, uh, exploiting it, AfriJet, uh, providing those, uh, those vital links and repatriation where they could. And governments calling up on, on the operators to help them out. Mm -hmm. So again, it reaffirms what we already believed, which is uh, the ATR is, is a perfect platform. For the moving, operation. Yeah, Mark, moving to um, another market that um, is always intriguing and suffers from many of the same characteristics as Africa, the Caribbean. Um, we've I seen the news in the last... About, I thought you were going to ask me about the UK. That <laughs> well, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I dare I dare do that because I, I I know the reaction I get from you. 
I'm going, I'll give you I'll give you some steers of the UK market. All joking aside, but but we can come on to that. Sorry, your yes. question. So um, on the Caribbean, I mean, clearly we've all seen the news about Liap in the last couple of days, which is just no surprise to anyone given how frequently it, it has occurred. How how can a manufacturer help um, an airline in that particular position? Because you you know you you must have some advance notice that it is going to happen. Um, you can you can see it. Can you can you help them or are you know are they too far gone by that coach? Look, um, you know, no one has a blank checkbook, right? Um, Absolutely. What what we've we've had to do as a as an OEM during the COVID crisis to to help and and be close to our customers is is what we do on a daily basis. I think, in fairness, John, the easiest answer to that question is you have to take it on a case by case basis. Um, you know, if you look across the uh, the aviation spectrum. Of course, the OEMs are, are implicated and involved in these situations. But equally, uh, you know, look at the lessors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the the whole model is dependent on aircraft flying and revenues coming in. Um, that's dried up overnight. Um, you know, from our perspective, we've had no order cancellations. Um, so we're trying to, of course, work with our customers to. To help them uh, as they get back on their feet, but as I as I mentioned earlier, we think regional will be the leader in this process. It's going to be the first back to market that's supported by all the the stats and and data. Even my even my data supports that. Well, I was so. just about to say the OAG's own data kind of confirms that, um, and we're we're using it to show you know the drop off was slower, and the recovery is is faster. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're of course using it to show it's it's even better than other types of aircraft, but um, certainly your, your data supports that, yes. Sure. So, did I hear you correct in saying that throughout this whole event, you have not had a cancellation of an order or a anything like that at all? Because when I, you know, when I hear stories about airlines and their cancellations for larger aircraft type, you just think, well, it's, it's no surprise. So, Equally, if you've retained everything, um, that must speak volumes for for people's experiences and expectations. Yeah, I mean, you you, you have to recognise the reality that we had a production line that was shut down. Uh, you know, people were were at home, uh, locked down, mm -hmm. so that had a stagger on of, uh, effect, of course, on on the yeah. uh, production plan. But uh, as as we sit today, that that information is correct. Um, you know, we were confident that even though we're realistic about the future, I mean, this, there's no question this event is, is going to have a, a staggering event, uh, impact across the whole industry. I mean, this is an, an 18 to 24 month window of, of distress. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing is those green shoots emerging in, in the burnt forest. You know, there are plenty yeah. of little things popping up. Will they all come through to fruition? Of course not. Even if some of them do, it clearly shows that the regional footprint is is going to be one of the strongest recoveries uh, we think. Yeah, I think it, it, it's an excellent analogy to uh, to describe it like that. Um, and talking of burnt forest, then um, as a as a man who now has a French passport, um, <laughs> how how do you view what's happened in the UK? I mean, from so many perspectives, we seem to have got our aviation support strategy wrong um you know we went into this with fly b um literally if they could have hung on for two or three weeks they may still be here who knows um but regional connectivity in the uk has been decimated hasn't it look um it's it's um you know it's a very british habit to, to look at the worst in ourselves right um but uh, i think the reality is if you look at um just at the beginning of COVID, of course, you had the uh, collapse of Flybe that left a huge vacuum in the market. Uh, you know, we see our friends at Logan Air uh, expanding nicely into some of that space. Um, you know, some of the, the flights that they were doing were, were again, key in the recovery. Um, I'm personally bullish on, on the UK market. I think the importance of, of regional connectivity is, is clear. Um, you know, we've got our, our friends in Blue Islands and Orrini are, are both watching the space as well. Yeah. Um, we would see um, 
encouraging signs, certainly with the British government's position, in recognizing the value and the importance of connecting those communities. Um, and as I've shared with you, John, in, in a separate conversation, if you take the context of, of Brexit, my own personal opinion, um, regardless of what the final outcome will be, the rule book is going to change uh, on trade between the UK and mainland Europe, um, which means people are going to have to uh, physically meet. Mm -hmm. It will not be, okay, what are the rules and it's standard and we're used to them. The rule book will have changed potentially in, in multiple industries. So people are going to have to physically uh, eyeball each other to, to re-establish those business relationships. And uh, they're not all going to fly through um, Heathrow, Gatwick, uh, Manchester. They want direct connectivity. Some of them will want to maybe get home to their, their, their own bed in the evening rather than stay in hotels, particularly in the current climate. So we're, we're bullish on the UK. I mean, it's, it's a market that needs to, um, needs to recover a little. But uh, the British population, you know, tend to, to fly around a lot and, and travel. Uh, well, I, I think part of it is, Mark, that, you know, aside from you and I who can walk on water, most people still have a, a, a need to, um, to use air services. And I, you're absolutely right. We, we need that regional connectivity, and I'm sure it, it will come back. In terms of sustainability, Mark, um, I read your stuff and uh, admire the the carbon credentials and and everything that you talk about. But is that important to airlines in their factoring of decision making today? Uh, yes, it is, John. And, and thank you for for the, the comment. Um, you know, I think it was it was key before COVID. Um, you you could see some of the impact that is uh, certainly coming through from. Uh, cash that's being attributed to, to airlines in the industry um, with conditionality put in by, by the government or the state to say, look, I want you to, to fly uh, with, with less emissions um, to be uh, as green as possible and more sustainable. Um, and as you know, on, on you know, the ATR message that we, we really try to hammer home is, is we burn 40% less fuel and consequently lower CO2 emissions than a comparable regional jet against the ATR-72. Uh, you can get away from that. And, and we think that will still be applicable uh, moving out of this. And I think the population's uh, people have also uh, sensed that the, the, the trend is turning here. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, we're, we're confident will still be a key factor for and us moving forward. That, that 40% fuel efficiency in the context of, you know, a scenario where, heaven forbid, the price of oil suddenly escalated to $100 compared to where it is now, which, you know, isn't inconceivable. We didn't think COVID-19 ever existed. Um, yeah. That would be a dramatic saving for an industry that needs that help, wouldn't it? Look, I, I think that's spot on. And, and just to support that, there was a, there was a study came out um, by, by JP Morgan pre-COVID, which they updated during COVID, uh, which reaffirmed their view that uh, they could see $100 a, a barrel. And that's on the pretext that the industry has just stopped all investment, uh, frozen everything. And when the upturn comes, the, the demand will be so strong that the, the supply won't be there. And uh, we'll be back into that ping pong of, of higher prices. And that simply you know, plays into the the advantage of, of the, the ATR yet again on, on the cost basis for, for those shorter routes. You've, you've been around um, the industry probably as long as I have, um, as we know from sharing some, some wine and discussions about mutual contacts in very old airlines. Yes. Um, if, you look, if you look forward a couple of years, what do you think the key learnings will have been from this whole COVID event, and how could you how could you apply those to um, ATR and, and its future success? Oh, that's a, that's a fascinating question, and, and it's one I've I've debated with with a number of people and, and quizzed my my family and my kids on. Um, I think it is going to to change the the world. I think we will look back on this event. Um, why this was a marker where, where a lot of things changed. If we had a crystal ball and able to predict what those will be, 
my own view is I think it's going to really catapult the digitalization process higher up the, the food chain. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we see that just on the sheer logistics of of working from home and how you connect. Um, you know, for us to speak today and and how to connect. You, you know, we tried a couple of different avenues before we linked. Yeah, and that will become second nature. Um, I think travel patterns will change. I think people will reflect a lot more on do I necessarily need to fly? Um, and again, I think that kind of plays to our advantage because the regional will still be a core part of that. Um, will it make people uh, perhaps a little bit more reflective on, on their general impact on the, the planet? Possible. Will it change consumers and patterns? You know, we're seeing a, a huge uptick in e-commerce today, but, you know, I, I saw one interesting piece in the UK where they suggested the, um, the government handout was being contemplated to get people to go and eat in restaurants and shopping may not actually work because people may not feel they want to just go out and, and go shopping in the high street again. You know, why do they need to buy so much stuff? Yeah. <laughs> so it could change in so many industries. I think for, for ATR, we, we've always tried to be a little bit ahead of that curve. Um, I think we've shown that through our campaign into life and how we, we do really believe in, in what we're doing. Sorry about these little beeps. Emails. Oh, I'm yeah. The challenge of digital technology. Um, so we would say that the connectivity we offer and, and bringing people together, you know, if there's one thing we all learned about COVID was to place a higher value on human contact and personal relationships. Mm -hmm. When you suddenly realize you couldn't see uh, your brand or whatever, that started to hit home and brought a reality check. Yeah. So, Mark, final, final question or sort of thoughts your connecting the future report um suggested around 3,000 new turboprop aircraft required by 2037 so which way which way is this going to tip is this going to tip to your advantage and 3,000 becomes 3,500 or maybe even more or do you think this is going to lead to every aircraft manufacturer seeing perhaps um, a shortfall against the industry's expected demand for aircraft um, that we saw in January of this year? Well, no, I, I think inevitably it's going to be a readjustment across the board. Um, I think the readjustment in certain categories of aircraft will be quite um, dramatic. Um, what we've tried to highlight is whilst we will be, like anyone else in this industry, impacted, uh, we just think we will be the, the first to, to recover. We're seeing those signs already. Uh, and uh, we will be there tomorrow because we will still build and deliver aircraft and we'll win new deals. And we'll win new deals based on the, you know, the platform we offer really ticks some fundamental boxes. Are those boxes more important today? Some of them are. Others will be perhaps a little less uh, impactful. But on the whole, um, we would we would see uh, certainly a reduction, but a stability at least in, in the turbo pop importance in the market. It is you know it is remarkable, fascinating, and something that we learn at that, that moment in time, but frequently just forget because we we probably get awestruck by big is beautiful and new technology and exciting aircraft, etc. But every time we go through an economic crisis and a, a black swan appears. It is always the regional markets and the regional aircraft that come back first, isn't it? It is. It, it's just like we we ignore them at our peril, and and every time they just knock on the door and remind us of how important they are. Uh, correct, and that, and if you look at all the the crises we faced, even though this one is unprecedented. Oh, uh, you've used that word. And uh, post nine eleven. Uh, same story, you know, uh, the, the regional connectivity of the regional aid, aviation industry bounced back fairly quickly and, and strong. And it will happen again, won't it? We certainly hope so. And that's what we're working towards, John, uh, full time. Brilliant. Mark, I'm going to stop the recording there. Thank you very much, John. Real pleasure and I appreciate the time. Huh?